very interested in the question of how some literary characters get to become shorthand, cultural shorthand, and others don't. And I would be fascinated to hear your views of this. So why is it the case, for instance, that um, you can have a, that, that the, some characters are incredibly memorable, like Big Brother um, or Hamlet, uh, and other characters aren't. Is there some way of describing what makes a character stick around in the cultural imagination uh, for a long time? I have a sort of theory about it, but I'd be very interested to hear what characters stick with all of you, or why characters stick with all of you. Someone like to take a shot at that? You know, it's interesting because I have a very bad visual memory, so I don't really remember anything that I've read. I, I mean, in a sense of better stories. I just, uh, I recently reviewed a book for Oliver, uh, Oliver Sacks is coming out next week. And basically, he describes what he calls uh, mind, a face blindness, where you really can't recognize faces. And unfortunately, I'm one of those folks, but as a result of which I have very poor visual memory. And yet, I've done a lot of reading. So they're all embedded in my mind in some way, but I'm not exactly sure how. And I was reading somewhere that um, a critic said that what happens is a good character leaves a stain on your mind. Where it is exactly or how it works, I'm not quite sure, but it's, it is a stain and it may not be visual, it might be verbal. And that's why what's fascinating to me is I remember, for example, reading Camus' The Stranger. I don't really even know if that's a great book. But it, it is. But I, but <laughs> I, identify, I identify completely with the guy. I remember him thinking about, oh, my mother died, so what? And I thought, oh, that's not a bad idea. And you know, and I remember a couple of things in the book. I've read it like five times, but I don't remember much from it. But I remember all of it at another level. I mean, you know, every, and what happens is you sort of thrill of going back to the page and saying, oh yeah. And so it's refreshing something that's already there, like singing along to a, a symphony, where if I asked you to sing a symphony, you'll never get started. But once you hear the first word, it sort of runs along. And it's sort of interesting to think that some of this may be embedded as a work in progress. You follow what I mean? But that if you if, if I say Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, you're not gonna be able to start it, I don't think. But if I sing the maybe you can you know, maybe you can. But you know it's after you get <laughs> you can, but you know everything is coming. So you anticipate it. So it's in there somehow. So do you think that's going to change do you, with the way everything's going now? Do you think the way that we think about characters in other words, for me one of the things that's striking about the change of if you read you, your visual cortex really only sees letters and words and does very small, takes a small amount of energy to read. And the rest of your brain is free to imagine. Right? But if you do watch, uh, I don't know, MTV or something where there's these fast cuts, by the time I'm oriented to one cut, they're already on to the next. It takes all of my mental energy just to focus on the, on the screen. There's no room left to imagine. Uh, but we have become fascinated by this faster and faster and faster. Let me just ask you guys a question. How many of you people feel that it's changed your reading style <coughs> by, because of the internet? Feel that you read faster, you, you go through more speedily, you don't have the attention span? I would say yes, but in a somewhat different way. I separate reading books versus reading stuff on okay. the internet. You know, it's interesting, John up I had three desks, one for fiction, uh, and one for nonfiction, another one, I guess, for getting Israeli checks. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but he, he didn't write the same desk. So let me ask you, the panelists, if you'd like to comment on how you think this is changing the way you write, or the way you think about a memoir, and whether. And, and let me call, add a couple of things. Like, for example, you wrote a book in which you even quote some memory excerpts. I did. And you <laughs> have relied on your memory extensively, and in the, the part of Eden Express that I read over the weekend. You, you presented this graph, right? Right. 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 And so, uh, but now we understand that our memories are like sieves if we're lucky. And, uh, <laughs> otherwise, we're like uh, fishnet stockings. Most of it slips on through. And yet, there's some essential truth that we still retain, maybe like the stain I mentioned about the character. So maybe you guys will comment on memory. Do you want more? Uh, anyway, I think it, it's a version of the truth. I think you can tell when you are telling the truth, and you can tell when you're not telling the truth, because it's not satisfying. Yeah, it's presented.
presented as truth, but I think there's something, uh, uh, you know, about being absolutely certain about something, which means you're not even going to write about it at all. Why bother? This sort of precludes sort of um, what it takes to write or appreciate fiction. So it's an exploration, but you're trying to get at a truth, and maybe you're trying to get at a truth um, that's true for somebody else. Um, and that's, I, I'm interested in terms of how different it was the first and second and third time I read Huck Finn. And I think that's part of why something becomes memorable because so many other people here have read the same novels or they've all seen different uh, productions of Hamlet and different versions of Hamlet that, that sort of it compile, you know, it, 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 be, it, it gets another dimension. It becomes a, a three-dimensional figure or whatever through repetition. I think the, the fast cuts and the other kind of passive media we see is, is like a, it's like a drug. I'm convinced that, a lot, that over half of the obesity we're seeing and everything else, the kids are just sitting there completely passive, no imagination whatsoever, They're just sitting there in the zone. Now you, you as a pediatrician, do you think people read the same way? I try to get, you know, I try to talk to them about reading the same way. I don't think they do, no. Mark, <laughs> People are not reading as much or the same as they used to. And I always love it when a 15 or 16 year old comes into me and has read something and finally gotten the idea that they're not alone uh, and that this world exists. And it's a beautiful thing to see, but I don't know. It doesn't happen for everybody. Have you been able to influence parents at all? I think so. My own subversive way. <laughs> 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 I, sometimes I find myself saying something like I'd be all for beating children if it worked and uh, <laughs> so they realize I'm not judging them <laughs> <laughs> um, parents sometimes come in to me and say oh my child just doesn't read and I'll I'm kind of mean and I'll say oh what have you read lately yeah. <laughs> and uh, if somebody says to me, well, I don't have time to read. I'm too busy, you know, running to talk to the teacher about why he's having problems. Uh, I get worried. And so I tell people whenever I can, actually I'm pretty obnoxious about it, that, you know, children seeing you read and your reading to them matters. Um, I don't know it from the scientific point of view, but I personally have never been able to lose myself in a book that's on a machine. Uh, we sell ebooks on our website. Nobody ever buys them, but we sell them. Um, but uh, I've tried those different machines, and on all of them, I was conscious at all times that I was reading a machine. When I am involved in a great book, I don't care what's going on. In fact, my children always knew if they wanted to get a yes answer to can I go over to so-and-so's house, just wait till I was reading, and I'd say yes, because I'd be too busy. So I think our brain must work differently. And I find that when I have tried to read a book on a machine, I'm not relaxed. I'm, I come out of it more nervous than when I started. Uh, while when I am reading a great novel or a great memoir, I am uh, energized from the experience. That's why I mentioned about the monkey ring experiment. In other words, for us, the book is an extension of ourselves. How many people here like the smell of books? How many like the smell of Kindle? 